You know, Christmas really is all about love. It's the bottom line. It is about love. So let me just say, first and foremost, Merry Christmas. Really glad that you're here. Really glad that you're here to consider, to celebrate the good news of Jesus. You know, I've often thought <clears throat> about Caesar Augustus during this time, which is weird, right? Like nobody else in the room thinking about Caesar Augustus. I'm thinking about Caesar Augustus. Why? You remember that part in Luke where it says that Caesar Augustus required this census and then that's kind of what forced Mary and Joseph to go to Bethlehem and Jesus to be born in Bethlehem and fulfill all this prophecy. And then Caesar Augustus doesn't get much more than that other than he required a census in this story. But, but if you <clears throat> understand the, the day, Caesar Augustus was worshiped as the son of God. Did you know that? Like he is the adopted son of Julius Caesar. His name is also Octavian. We have a month at, named after him, August. He, uh, he is, was at, at, in the time frame. he was born in 63 BC. So this is like born maybe 50, 60 years before, before Jesus was born. He was, he was in the eyes of Rome, the son of God. And in 9 BC, some artisan, some architect in a place called Perenne, Perenne which is in uh, modern day Turkey, etched a message of good news about the son of God. And I, I wanna show it to you so you know I'm not lying. I just wanna show you this picture. So this is the, this is the etching and uh, we're gonna stand and read that responsively. I'm just kidding. Uh, it, it's hard to read. I just want to give you one little part. Here's what, what it says and, and the part that's most important to us. In 9 BC etched in stone, the birthday of the God Augustus was the beginning of good news for the world that came through him. That was street level conversation. Augustus has a gospel it's the same word, evangelion, this good news of great joy for all the people. That's 9 BC. It's etched, etched in a temple uh, in Perenne. And in about 6 BC, that's when Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And he's way different. His, his circumstances are way different than Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus rules from Rome. Caesar Augustus is not known for his love. He's, what do you think he's known for? Power. Power. One of the most powerful men in the world at that time. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. If you look at Jesus' lineage, it's, it's embarrassing. If you're just going to compare kings, you know, Caesar Augustus, his father, Julius Caesar, Jesus has like Rahab, Tamar, uh, Judah. These are like uh, adulterers and prostitutes and, uh, and David, the king, who's also an adulterer. You know, it's, it's not one of those you roll out and go like, look, I, I'm the king. See all these great people that make me the king. Although his lineage is prophetic and, and clear, but it, it it begs the question like, <laughs> whose good news is right? And you know, we all have this responsibility with the life we have, however, however long we, we get to live on the planet. We all have this responsibility to decide what good news will we receive as true? What will we place our faith in? And I hold up to you Caesar Augustus who gets one little part that says, you know, he caused the census to happen. And Jesus born in Bethlehem. And I'd say the difference between the two, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of differences between the two, but the, the most 
most glaring difference between the two of them is love. This is bottom line. It's, it's love. There's nothing etched in stone that says Caesar Augustus, the greatest love expression of the love of God ever. No, it's like Caesar Augustus will crush your head if you don't do what he says. Caesar Augustus will bring the peace of Rome, but if you disobey Caesar Augustus, you will be crucified. This is Caesar Augustus, right? So Jesus comes, he's born in Bethlehem. And, and here's what Mark, in Mark chapter one, verse one, he says, it, it's like he knew what it said in Perenne in nine BC. He said, the beginning of the gospel, same word, Evangelion of Jesus Christ, the son of God. It's like the same phrase. It's just, he says Jesus instead of Caesar Augustus. Why is the gospel of Jesus good news? It's just because of, it's love mainly, love mainly. Have you ever asked yourself the question like, how could God love me? Have you ever been in a situation or circumstance you thought to yourself like, I've done something so egregious now that there is no way God could love me. He might love them because they're better than me, but not me. You know? um, the, the scripture is clear about Jesus when we come to Christmas and we think about the incarnation and the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, we get like three really clear, really simple thoughts just laced with love. Matthew chapter one, verse 21 tells us he was sent to save. He was sent to save. So it says, she will bear a son, that's Mary. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. His name means he's gonna save people from their sins. The sin is our biggest problem. We might think we have a lot of problems and, and there are a lot of things that we could point at and complain about and all those kinds of things. But sin is our biggest problem. It's my biggest problem personally. It's our biggest problem on the planet, our sins and the sins of other people. It's the biggest problem we've got. And the scripture says, he, meaning Jesus, was sent to save his people from their sins. So imagine this. There was that sky-splitting moment outside of Bethlehem where the angels sing, you know, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill to, to men. And they, they come to lowly shepherds and tell them to go to Bethlehem. And they see the baby lying in the manger. And it says they left and they, they want to tell everyone what, they, what they've seen. That was a glorious moment. But in that moment, the only reason Bethlehem is happening is because Later, 30 some odd years later, this baby will be crucified just outside the city walls of Jerusalem. Probably not like five miles from where that cave was he was born in. He came to save. And that's love. Sometimes people don't think about Jesus, right? The scripture teaches that Jesus has always been. That all things were created through him, by him, and for him. It, the, the doctrine of it would be that he's the second person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's always been, but when he came to be born in Bethlehem, it's, it's called the incarnation, the enfleshing. It's like he put skin on, he became helpless to grow up to save us from our sins. See, he was sent to save. That's what Matthew tells us. And this is apparently really good news because we cannot save ourselves from our, our sin. The second thing we get in the scriptures, uh, another gospel writer, John, one of the disciples, teaches us that Jesus is the greatest expression of God's love. The son of God, Jesus, is the greatest expression of God's love. Simple verse, many people have heard it, but listen to it closely. John chapter 3, 16 to 17. For God so loved the world. Now let's just stop there for a minute. What kind of God is this that loves the whole world? All the people groups, all the nations, every sinner on the planet. For God so loved the world, that he acted, it says, that he gave his only son. This is at 
God's initiation. He gave. I always, I always think about this when we, we, we kind of teach this unwritten doctrine. If you've just accepted Jesus into your heart, just accept them into your heart. But understand before you accept them into your heart, before you take that action, he gave to begin with out of love that you might even have the opportunity to believe. See, So for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, not just any son, his only son, the one he loves. I mean, it's a deep conversation, but he, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit had been in perfect community for so long and the son became a man. Walked the planet because his father gave him. He gave his only son that whoever, whoever is an umbrella term, you know what it means? Whoever, my Jewish friends, my Muslim friends, all my friends of every kind of sin stripe you can imagine, whoever, Believes. Now that, that's a tricky word. Believes. This is, this is a Greek word like pishua. It, mean, it means believe to the point of action. You remember, uh, I remember the, my dad trying to get me to jump in the pool. And he, he kept saying he would catch me when I was really little. He'll catch me. And I thought to myself, will he, will he catch me? And, and, and for me to say, I could say, I believe that, but if I never jump, do I really believe that, right? It's the kind of belief that like takes a step and it, it, it's an action. It's not just, I believe some content, but it's a given my life that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now that's, that's a loaded statement too, because the whole, whole Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. Like the sin in my life causes me to deserve death and eternal separation from God. But the scripture teaches the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, which means even when my body die, my soul's gonna live on in the presence of God because of Jesus, not separated from God because of my sin. It's because of Jesus, because he came to save, because he saved me, because I couldn't save myself for my own sin. It's the greatest expression of God's love. It goes on. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Do you know how many people walk on the planet think God wants to condemn them? Who th they, they think because people have told them or they've believed false teaching or false religion that God is about condemning them. Like if you say a cuss word, he will definitely strike you with lightning because he wants to condemn you. That's his heart. That's not what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, through Jesus. He came because he loved the whole world, everybody in it, every people group, every, every type of sinner. We like to categorize them. Like cussing isn't as bad as, you know, some other things. For God, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And this is the, the, it's the greatest expression of God's love. You, you follow any of the other religions, what you're, you're gonna find is you don't find a savior who kills himself for the sake of your sin. <laughs> Here we have God crushing his own son on the cross for the sake of our sin. It's the greatest expression of God's love. Last thing, Paul, he said in Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39, he just shows us that, that the love of God through Jesus will not be undone. It cannot be undone. He loves you. He loves you. Now, there's a chance that some of you have heard that before. There's a chance some of you grew up hearing it over and over and over and over again. There's a chance that some of you even went to Christian school, even here, 
and you heard it every day of your life, and, and you heard it so much that you've forgotten what it means, that you've become sort of inoculated to the fact that the sovereign creator of the universe, who sent his son, his only son, the one whom he loved to die on a cross to save you from your sins, so that you realize, like, according to the scripture, there is so much past the 80 plus years that you might get on this planet. There is eternity so that you could be with him for eternity because he loves you. All of the scripture is about Emmanuel, God with us, bringing us into his presence through his son, forgiving us of our sins, cleansing us of all unrighteousness. And he does it for love and that love cannot be undone. Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39, Paul said, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It can't be undone. It's secure. It's not like a human relationship where you can make someone mad enough that they're gonna walk out on you. He loves perfectly. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So if you're one of those people, you think to yourself, like, if you knew what I had done, you would know that this does not apply to me. But that's not true. All of the scripture reeks of the love of God for every person. And the ones that believe in him will find what Jenny was talking about in that video, adoption. You become his son, his daughter, not because of anything that you did, but because you're his in Christ and he fully loves you. Friends, family, this is the most important message you could hear. Caesar Augustus, he had good news. The good news of Caesar Augustus, he was born. And so you should worship him. That's, that's the good news, basically. He's the son of Julius. You should worship him. And then he died. And then Roman Empire went away. And do you know what happened with the king that was born in the cave? He, he, he was crucified on that cross. He rose again on the third day. And then his disciples, that small band of people that were following him, they got filled with his spirit. The scripture says they took this gospel of Jesus, not the gospel of Caesar, this gospel of Jesus to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the world, which was where Asia, it, at that time, Asia Minor, so far, the uttermost parts of the earth. Turkey, Priene, where it's carved, Caesar is, is, is what the good news is about. And what we find is that the gospel burned brightly in the second century, third century, fourth century in Rome. Why do you think we have the book of Romans from Paul? And the uttermost parts of the world didn't stop in Asia Minor, but it spread all the way to you and to me in this day. And while Caesar Augustus, you may know him for causing the census that made Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem for Jesus to be born, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, his kingdom is ever expanding. It continues. Why? It's powerful, but it's not motivated by power. It's motivated by love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. I wonder, tomorrow, tomorrow's going to be a good day. Anybody, anybody like enjoy driving around looking at Christmas lights this year? Come on, raise your hand, be loud, be proud. Anybody had like a peppermint mocha, uh, something really Christmassy to eat? Who likes fruitcake? Any of you? 
That's weird. I don't like that stuff. <laughs> That's weird. But it's christmas so we'll count it, right? It's like we're at the pinnacle of this Christmas season that we've been celebrating, listening to Christmas music since we cleared the table from Thanksgiving and all of that. But I just wonder how the good news of Jesus Christ like extends beyond tomorrow morning. You know, that moment where like you've got the plastic bag and you're just picking up the paper and put everything out and then you're like, okay, you know, 364 days till Christmas. How does it it extend? And here's the deal. We live in a a, a strange time in history. I don't don't know all of what's going on in in, in the spiritual realm, but I know it's a strange time in history. And here's what's most important. Whatever happens, circumstantially, world leaders, all that stuff, whatever happens, the Caesars of the world will pass. The pandemics of the world will pass. Jesus Christ remains the same forever. His love endures forever. And so I would say to you, you need to respond to that either in worship because you have relationship with him and you say glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. Or maybe you need to respond to that in this way, like, I I thought you couldn't love me. And I hear the good news that says, no matter what I've done or what my faith background is or where I come from, you love me. And then maybe you need to do like I did with my dad and go ahead and jump in the pool. Like you just need to believe. And the scripture says the way you do that is that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. And in that moment, you're saved. Jesus does the saving. Your work is to believe. We're going to um, just take a moment. We put some cards under every chair tonight, and it, they look like this. And, you know, I'd love everyone to fill one of these out tonight. That would be great for me. But if you're here and you would say to yourself, look, I want to believe in this God who loves me no matter what and saves me from myself. I want to believe. There's a box here. Just check it. Now, I hate these on the one hand because I don't want you to think if you check that box, something magic happened. This card is a card. What has to happen is you have to humble yourself before God and say, forgive me, save me from my sins. You are Jesus, the son of God. When you check the box, what you're doing is telling our pastors, hey, I just decided I want to trust Jesus and I need help knowing what to do next. That's why you check the box. What we're going to do now, you're just going to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm going to give you time alone with God. Pray, ask him to speak to you. i will just give you a few minutes. If you don't know how to pray, you know, maybe, maybe you just say something to Jesus like, I, I realize tonight you really do love me. Forgive me f- for my sin, all of it. Clean me up on the inside. I believe that you died on a cross to save me from my sins. Just save me, Jesus. It can be that simple. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your birth that we celebrate this time of year, but we also thank you for your crucifixion, your resurrection, 
your ascension to the right hand of the Father and the simple fact that you're coming back again. We look forward to it. We thank you that you forgive us of our sins, that you're a God of mercy and grace, that Jesus, you came not to condemn, but to save. And I pray that you would save souls right now in Jesus' name. We love you. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.